Hello? Uh, yes, can all hear me all right? Cool. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, this is obviously the What's New with Sours with Molly. Really excited about it. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate you guys coming here to this one specifically. Um, Molly is the USA, East Coast, and Japan technical sales manager for Le Mans. Uh, started a brewing career in 2006. Brewing in Japan is working for, worked at Jolly Pumpkin and New Holland Brewing before coming to the barrel program manager at Brooklyn Brewery in 2013. 2016, she returned for some uh, proper tea and barbecue at the operation manager at Trophy Brewing. Uh, joined Lillemon Brewing in 2018 and now lives in Raleigh. So um, thank you, Molly, and welcome. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing. Thanks. Uh, can you guys hear me? Sometimes that gets a little bit wonky. Um, cool. Yeah, so excited to be here. My first time being at this conference. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, stuff that's kind of new in the realm of sour beers. Um, quick overview of what we're going to be discussing. Um, sorry if I go in and out. I feel like I'm going in and out. Um, so a lot of you guys might know this, uh, we're, but we're really quickly going to just go over what is involved in sour beer production. We're going to discuss bacteria and then discuss what's new in it, discuss yeast and sour beer, kind of what's new in that realm, and then what else is out there, just go through some general best practices and kind of like tips and tricks and stuff. Uh, this is kind of meant for, this slide deck is kind of meant for you guys to take away. So um, there, is, there are a lot of slides and there might be a lot of text, but it's stuff for you guys to refer back to if you need to. Um, so what is sour? Uh, the history of sour beer, you know, as many of you know, it's famously European in origin. Uh, and then the U.S. and other countries, but you know, mostly the states kind of took it over and we've developed our own styles. Um, the important point here is the term sour refers to different acids produced by a variety of bacteria and or yeast. Uh, it does not necessarily refer to or indicate barrel aged, barrel fermented, or mixed culture fermentation. Uh, I don't know if many of you remember, but there was a few years ago at a CBC uh, it's like maybe 2014 or something, where New Belgium and a couple other companies were trying to develop a lexicon for sour beer and trying to differentiate, you know, kettle sour versus um, uh, spontaneously fermented beer and stuff like that. That seems to have not really gone anywhere, but the educational component, what they were trying to achieve, does seem to have gone someplace. So, you know, I think increasingly consumers are becoming more aware of what a sour beer is versus um well what you know a kettle sour beer is versus you know a spontaneously fermented lambic or something like that so i think we're on our way and that just helps develop the entire lexicon and the entire encyclopedia of this category which as we're going to discover is increasing by the day so um this is just an example of the growth of diversity in the sour category so some of these are you know, spontaneously fermented, some of these are kettle soured, some of these have genetically engineered yeast in them. So it's just, you know, there's quite a range there. And they all, they all make delicious sour beers. So jumping in, we're going to look at production methods for producing sour beers using bacteria. Uh, the point here is that there are a range of sour beer styles that can correspond with different production techniques. Uh, and these different production techniques will offer different flavor impacts and offer, well, pose potential cross-contamination risks. So it's just something you all want to be aware of. Um, so some production styles are more appropriate than others depending on your production space and your distribution choices. But they all are in that sour beer palette range. Um, so just to take Bob Ross there, we, you know, we're all, poly we're all part of the same palette. Um, and what we're going to dive in a little bit here is the pro and cons in terms of contamination, risk, and production time. So spontaneous fermentation, this is where all this text comes in that you guys can refer back to. Um, you know, this is, these are the styles you can make, these are the benefits, here's the production method usually done by a cool ship. The important thing to know is that the, in the terms of production method, it does require some time. Um, and it does require some capital intensive uh, investment in terms of if you're doing this right, you really need to have separate pieces, uh, separate spaces, separate uh, equipment, separate pretty much everything. And it does pose a high level of cross-contamination risk. 
um, this is part of the reason why Jolly Pumpkin early on, you know, they committed themselves to be fully sour. So we were, when I was there, we were doing, um, you know, uh, we were cropping off uh, the top of the yeast, and we were doing that top cropping and putting that top crop in plastic buckets. And, you know, my head, I'm like, this is really scary, but we were in a sour brewery, so that porous bucket material, that level of cross-contamination risk that that bucket posed wasn't so much a concern because everything was just in the air. So it's important to note that the shit is in the air. Do not forget that. Uh, it comes from everywhere. Uh, so kettle souring will pose a little bit more greater control. Um, these are the styles, but if it's production method. Um, but you're going to have a lower level of risk. Um, and this is because you're employing a heat kill step to kill the bacteria. Um, and your capital cost, your level of investment there can be a lot less due to that. Um, it is important to note, and we'll come back to this, that you really want to be careful in the yeast selection that you use, uh, as well as your bacteria, but your yeast selection is actually really important here too, because not all yeast can, fermer, can ferment an acidic beer uh, or an acidic wort. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. And then we have something we call the bacteria fermenter souring method. Uh, this is basically where you add bacteria and you add yeast at the same time to your fermenter. Um, you want to add your bacteria first so you don't have uh, a competition between the bacteria and the yeast at the same time. And you want to add your bacteria um, at the level or at the temperature that the bacteria likes. So that's important to note as well. Your, your fermenter will need to be at that temperature. Um, and the level of cross contaminant risk is, risk is a little bit higher because you know, you don't have that heat kill step to kill that bacteria. So it will still continue on. Um, the separate packaging line, the separate parts, that is, you know, best practice that would be recommended in this case. Um, and this is also where, you know, you want to choose a yeast that you would add 24 to 48 hours later after you see your desired level of acidity develop. You want to choose a, a yeast that will be able to ferment that, that wort or that, that beer. Uh, appropriately. Um, I think that was all I wanted to say about that. There, were, mm, there might have been another point there. I'll come back to that. Um, so for sources of lactobacillus, um, these also offer different degrees of production and flavor consistency. Um, you can get them from the malt, yogurt, uh, nature, bottle culture. Um, just know that unknown sources uh, increase the potential for production and flavor inconsistency. So if you have a brand that you really want to dial in, using yogurt all the time probably isn't going to allow you to get the flavor consistencies that you're looking for over time. It's just something to be aware of. Uh, Labrador, lab cultures are going to be the most controllable in terms of production flavor and acid management. And the reason that is is because you can go to a lab, say us or Mega or whoever, and just say, I want a plantarum, I want a Helvetica's and you would know what temperature that those would work best at, as this chart kind of shows. So different lactobacillus have, will have optimal temperatures that they will produce lactic acid and acetic at. Um, the plantarum A, that's our sour pitch, and the Helvetica's is Helvetica's pitch, but we, you know, you, we just took a bunch of these. And you can see, like, you know, at 20C, they're not producing a lot of lactic acid, but at 30C, the plantarum is like super happy. And the Helveticus, for example, is moderately happy. But then at 40C, it's a reverse. So your, your window and knowing what your organism is, that will just help you dial in your production time when you're producing these beers. If you're adding them to a barrel or anything like that, uh, it's just something to be aware of competition um, which we'll talk about in a bit in terms of uh, mixed fermentation. But you will want to know that the bacteria, unless they're boiled, will still be alive. But they'll have an optimal temperature range which they'll produce acid. And they'll even produce a acetic acid just depending on that temperature range. Uh, so going back to using unknown sources of lactobacillus, uh, lactobacillus, um, your optimal temperature 
you know, they'll slowly create lactic or not if they're not at their optimal temperature. Flavors, um, some strains of uh, bacteria will create off flavors, so some will create diacetyl. Um, your hop tolerant, hop sensitive, this goes back to that fermenter bacteria souring. Some strains of um, lactobacillus are very hop tolerant, and those will survive in, you know, in your fermentation should you not kill them. So if the LAB is hot tolerant, then you do risk cross-contamination devil. So you do want to choose a lactobacillus that you know has a low hop tolerance, so you know, kind of shrivel and die and be scared in the face of hops. Uh, and then alcohol tolerance. This is, this is something that Goose Island discovered, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. They were uh, producing um, uh, Bourbon County, which is a very, they thought they were completely safe because, you know, it's a hugely high alcoholic beer, but a strain of lactobacillus kind of persisted through that beer. Um, and that, that I think it was like alcohol thermotolerance is what they called it or something. Uh, but there are strains of lactobacillus that will continue on. So unless you actually like kill it, like through a boil or a heat step, then they will persist. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, so looking at what's new, that's my bunny. Um, this is not exactly new, but it's interesting. We're going to look at bacteria metabolism and its effects on flavor. This is something the wine industry has looked at for a long time, um, and we're now slowly starting to recognize that you know it could be could be applicable to beer. Uh, in particular, we're going to look at biogenic amines. Um, just raise your hand, anybody who knows what these are. Cool. I did not when I started. Um, so what they are, <laughs> they, that's the Cliff Notes version. They're small, small organic nitrogen compounds found in fermented foods. Um, so they're naturally occurring. You know, you find them everywhere. Uh, and they are a result of an enzymatic decarboxylation of amino acids by a specific organ. Basically, lactic acid can create this. Lactic acid bacteria can create these biogenic amines if they interact with an amino acid. Um, but their effects on health you know, at a certain level they're okay, but then at higher levels, that's when you start to get headaches, you get sweats, um, and just what would be categorized as an allergic reaction. For beer, and this is what they see in wine, and what the wine world is really concerned about, um, they can mask aroma. So apart from, you know, creating those sweaty, uh, headache-inducing effects, they can mask aroma and they cr can create metallic or meaty off flavors. Um, which makes everybody grumpy. They're formed uh, through this amino acid interacting with um, uh, an LAB, a lactic acid producing bacteria. Um, this could be lactobacillus or PDO, um, and they, they all carry this gene that can code for this histine decarboxylase. So histine is a big that's a big biogenic amine. Uh, and that's probably the most common one that people have heard of. They're detected usually by HPLC. Um, and to avoid or remove bacteria selection is important. Um, Lactoplantobacillus plantaria can degrade or reduce them. But we're trying to investigate the removing part in beer. And this is stuff that they've been investigating in wine and why a, a lot of the wine literature for bacteria, you know, they they are pushing for winemakers to know what bacteria they're using to prevent these. Um, so we did some initial testing. We did a kettle sour beer at 10 hectoliters, so 60% um, malt extract, 40% wheat, uh, standard Play-Doh, uh, and we had two uh, separate fermentations fermented with a Chico ale strain. Uh, so Lactobacillus plantarum and then Lactobacillus helvicus. Uh, yeah, did you know that the plantarum had a change, name a change, the name has changed? Because that did happen. Uh, it is, that is the official uh, species name now. There's a 70 page paper about it. If you are interested in it, I can give it to you. Um, but yeah, it's say different species um, that is broken out. But anyway, so 
here are our wart control. So this is just the what we started out with. So you can see these levels. Um, they're not they're they're high, but they're not like you know eye raisingly high. But we're gonna look at histine here. And then we did a kettle sour where we used the plantarum, we used Helvetica's, and we used them at their appropriate temperatures. And you can see a decrease. It's not much, but it's slight. And then you see those uh, corresponding pHs there. And then we fermented with the Chico Ale strain. Um, and this is on day four and day six that we pulled these. So they dropped considerably, both of them. Um, so that kind of indicates that plantarum can be successful in reducing or not necessarily mopping up, but reducing the effects of these. Uh, we are carrying on this study uh, with doing it in um, an all malt wort base. So hopefully we should have some more results later. So now we're going to go talking about um, sour beer, using, producing sour beer with lactic acid producing yeast. Um, you know, yeast in general, they do produce lactic acid, just it depends on the species. Some will produce more than others. Uh, Saccharomyces just generally does not produce a lot. Brett can produce a little, but it's not a lot. And then the new kid on the block, sort of new, Lachancia, that's the one that people are really interested in because conferring a high degree of acidity uh, and offering different flavor characteristics with the potential of it being used in primary fermentation. Uh, I really like this chart. I don't know if you have the Wild Brews book by Jeff Sparrow. It's been out for like ages. This is, it's a phenomenal book. Um, I highly recommend it. But this chart really shows that, you know, you really need Bretomyces and your spontaneously fermented beer to mop up that PDO. Um, and it also shows the length of time in which that takes. So it's, it's, a, it's an older chart. Um, it might not be... I don't, there's probably others out there. I have. I don't think I've seen them. But it's, to me, it's like a really just nice kind of picture of what to expect for a spontaneously fermented beer. Um, so what's new? So we're gonna talk about Lachancia here. Um, I'm gonna go into a little bit of, and I apologize in advance, um, some commercial aspects of it, just for what we have from Wallamond. Um, and then kind of, but broaden it out to to what is possible. So Lachancia is a yeast species that produces lactic acid and ethanol during fermentation. So you could add it during primary fermentation. Uh, it is a species of non-saccharomyces, so similar to Brett. It is a non-sac yeast. And it's found in nature and it you know, produces a little bit more lactic acid or a lot more lactic acid than, saccharom than saccharomyces. Um, and then it, depending on the species, there are different species out there. Lachancia thermotolerance is like the big overarching one that a lot of people know about. But because, you know, a lot of this is still kind of developing, there's papers still needing to be written on these species, um, there are differences within that category. So I would say not all of the Lachancia thermotolerance, in fact, is exactly the same. Um, and that's something just to keep in mind and it's something, you know, if you're going to your yeast provider and they have a little chance yet, like really talk to them about, you know, how to use it because some, it's a very, it has a very specific fermentation profile. So we're going to talk about, this is Wild, this is uh, Philly Sour. Uh, it was founded by Matt Farber, Dr. Matt Farber from U Sciences and his team there. They found it on a tree in a graveyard. Uh, that's the graveyard. Um, it used to be called GY7B, uh, and you know we we are in partnership with that university. We dried it, and now we produce it as Philly Sour. Um, so it produces lactic acid from glucose. So your mash temperature is going to be really, really important when you use the strain. Um, and it prefers higher fermentation temperatures, so 22 to 30 C, and a higher pitch rate just to ensure that. You could use a lower pitch rate just for a bit high, um, and we have a best practice to talk about this. Um, and your pH range is going to have a moderate uh, acid level production. So you're looking at 3, 2, 3, 5. That all depends on the glucose amount in your wort. Um, and as you see here, so you have a 12 plate of wort, and then you have a 12 plate of wort that's uh, bumped up with glucose. And you can see the, how, the difference in pH. Um, yeah, so 
it's just something to keep in mind. This is one of the levers that you use that you can control your your acid management level with. These were fermented. I think these were fermented at 20 C, so that's why you see that fermentation time. It takes a lot longer. Uh, I'm going to show you this data. Uh, we found that most successful fermentations. When we first launched this, we launched it. I think it was like our winter, but it was Australia's summer. So the folks in Australia did a lot of uh, a lot of experiments at higher fermentation temperature ranges, and they found really successful fermentations happened a lot quicker at the higher temperature you pushed. Um, so that's why we kind of recommend a higher temperature range there, uh, and that's with variable pitch rates. So. Again, this is something to go back to, but you basically, you add it to your fermenter and it ferments. You just want to make sure your temperature and your pitch rate are correct. Um, the level of cross-contamination, we consider it pretty low because it doesn't sporulate and it's easily out-competed by Saccharomyces. So if you were to add a Saccharomyces strain to this, uh, to your beer, we'd recommend it adding it after the lactic acid production phase, so that 24 to 48 hour period. Uh, after you see your pH stabilize, add your second yeast. Uh, you don't necessarily need to. Uh, it can ferment just fine on its own as long as you have that temperature uh, correct. But if you're saying, if you want to make a sour saison, for example, and you want those phenolics from the saison strain, that's what you would want to add your second strain. Um, it is highly flocculent. It has this weird flocculation mechanism. Uh, it kind of looks like um, a lava lamp. It like clumps together magnetically, uh, and it is a slow fermenter. Uh, it will like shrivel and die. Not die, well, it will pretty much die, but it will shrivel in the face of Saccharomyces. So it just it, because Saccharomyces is such a dominant strain, it will not. Lachancia just can't compete in the face of that. And that's a really interesting note, kind of something to consider as you're producing sour beers. Look at your ratios and make sure you kind of you can play around with that, like which strain is going to be dominant at which point. Um, it's just something to think about when you're uh, wanting to get certain characters out of a certain strain. Just know that Brett, Lachancia, those are going to shrivel and bacteria in the face of a dominant Saccharomyces strain. Uh, yeah, the viability falls dramatically at the end of fermentation. It will die by CIP procedures. Uh, it likes fruit. Um, so you see this, you see, right here you see the gravity quickly drop in uh, well, the pH quickly, the pH is the yellow line. You see that quickly drop, but your gravity is kind of staying pretty, cause like, you know, pretty high during the first couple of days of fermentation. And then after like, di after that 24 to 48, even 72 hour period, that's when your gravity really drops. But if you add fruit to it, and then you want to add fruit to it, then that will just help contribute to your, um, to your gravity, to your attenuation level. So there's just something to keep in mind there. Uh, it also is hop tolerant too. So now we're gonna talk about uh, bioengineered lactic acid producing yeast. Uh, so this is sour VCA. It uh, is a genetically engineered Saccharomyces strain that we uh, just, you know, we edited the lactic, the lactate dehydrogenase gene to produce, to turn it on and to make it produce more lactic acid. So you use it, it's a, it's a Saccharomyces strain, you use it like any Saccharomyces strain. Um, it has a wide fermentation temperature range and a pretty wide pitch rate, but it will produce a lot of lactic acid. And it is a very, very neutral strain. So that's another point. Lachancia will produce some flavors, some esters. So Philly Sour produces stone fruit, apricot, lemon pith. Sour VC is straight neutral, like you're, it's just, it creates this excellent base for you to add anything onto it. Uh, so, yep, it's a very quick fermenter. It's hop resistant. You just add what the add, the, the appropriate amount and to your fermenter and then let it go. Uh, it's a low cross contaminators, contamination risk due to viability. It falls dramatically at the end of fermentation and it will die and kill easily by CIP, CIP procedures. Um, I'm going to show you this graph. Cigar City did a lot of early work on this, and if you want to see some of their work, I'm happy to send you this presentation this, that they did. Um, but this is 
they did some reed prejudging trials very, very early on when we first uh, came out with a strain. And this is why we recommend you don't repitch it because the viability drops and you're just not producing as much acid and you're, it's a long time, it takes a long time to ferment. So you know, instead of not repitching, we re and this is the same for Philly Sour, we don't recommend repitching. We recommend you do a brew house prop. So if you have a 20 barrel fermenter, do 10 barrels into the 20, so two times 10. Um, brew your 10 barrels on the first day, add the yeast, second day come in, brew your second 10. And that, you know, helps give you some uh, economies and savings, but also like it's really helpful for the yeast. Um, and that, that's a technique I recommend doing for um, high gravity as well. Uh, yeah. So what else is out there? So we're gonna go back to sources. Uh, malt, we kind of touched on here, we kind of touched on bottle culture, but you know, we're increasingly seeing that connection between nature and lab cultures, which the Philly Sour kind of hits upon, uh, and beauty is everywhere. So we're gonna look at Koji. Um, how many of you guys have used Koji here? Cool. Uh, I know uh, Anthony, a transmitter, has used it, and we had a really good conversation about it before. Um, so some of this data comes from Dr. Brett Taubin and his team at App State, and then some of this comes from Baird Brewing and what they do in Japan. So it's a fun game. Uh, it produces high levels of alpha amylase, um, and it's inside production is dependent on temperature, other environmental factors. And you have different types, and different types have different flavors associated with them. Using it commercially, um, it's a bit, it's a bit interesting, and this is what you know Brian at Baird told me. I'm not sure how effective we would consider it in the states as being a sour beer, um, but it's just it's another option. So they use white koji. They add it to the mash. Uh, they add a lot of it to the mash, and he. Claims it produces citric acid primarily. I don't know if they've ever tested that, so, okay. Um, I just, I did their lab quickly, so I'm just like, okay. Uh, so they mash between 60 to 90 minutes, uh, and he says laudering can be an issue, which that makes sense. But their pH really doesn't drop that much. It only drops to like 4.2 at max. Um, but it will add extract, so, you know, bump up your OG if you're considering using this boil as normal. At the start of fermentation, the pH can range between 4.2 and 4.5. So going back to that, your yeast selection, you might not have to be as considerate with your yeast selection in an acidic beer if you're using koji, because pretty much this is, you know, a lot of beer can ferment at that range. Um, if you're using like the bacteria fermentation or kettle souring, you're wanting to get a yeast that is really good to ferment that or safely to ferment it, uh, we did, we've done some studies, and Ch the Chico strain broadly does pretty well in those environments. Uh, so th this is just another option. You know, it could be interesting. I don't, and it could also be just interesting to explore for like mildly acidic beers. So other thoughts, uh, you can play with these, and these are some of the ghost bottle projects we did at Brooklyn uh, with some sake lees of varying grades of sake. Uh, and then cider lees as well. All of these were added uh, at second, secondary fermentation, in secondary fermentation uh, in a barrel. So we took local one, we added the lees. I, I don't think I ever measured it by pH because I was lazy probably, um, but it did create sensorily a, a, a flavor of acid. Um, and it just, you know, created a really great beer. The, the sake leaves in particular is super interesting stuff. I want to touch on measuring acidity because, uh, as I said, I was pretty lazy in measuring acidity, but the importance of it is, um, is really, uh, it's a good thing to know because pH does not necessarily dictate uh, your acid level, and there's a reason for that. So we're gonna talk about titrateable acidity. And it's kind of like a weather analogy here. So pH is like the weather on, on the back of USA Today. It kind of broadly tells you everything. It's like, okay, it's gonna rain on the west coast, it's gonna stay dry on the east. 
then TTA, so total titratable acidity, is like the specific weather in Albany, New York. It's going to snow. Um, it will isolate the lactic acid because you're selecting for that. Uh, you're titrating that out. Uh, pH will look at citric. It will look at malic. It will look at you know, lactic, uh, acetic. It will just tell you broadly without telling you exactly what's in there. And that kind of matters because, um, you know, a pH of 3.5 in a lager versus a pH of 3.5 in an ale, that's going to taste completely different. Uh, and I feel like that's something you should know. Um, there is uh, an ASBC tool. Uh, it's just a ca uh, calculator and how you do it. Uh, you basically take a pH meter and you titrate it out with um, NaOH. Uh, and then you do this calculation. We put the calculation on our website, so if you've done the titration and you just don't want to do math, you can just go to our website and just like type in the numbers. Uh, and it will show you how much lactic acid you created. Uh, you can use this, you can modify this, the, that calculation for citric. Uh, in the Cider Maker's Handbook, there's that calculation for citric. You just need to know, I think, the mass and the mole. Uh, just gonna touch on cleaning best practices here. I've like, have been in you know all sour beer all sour breweries but also mixed firm breweries um this is a paper uh in the box here that came out in like the 1980s and it's the only one i found that really actually like dove into like specifically this is how much is killed by this amount um so i'm not sure how up to date it is but it's just something to to keep in mind that you know you are removing X amount doing this procedure, uh, so caustic two percent um, removes eighty four percent. Sanitizer fo followed by a sanitizer like immediately after you're killing ninety nine percent of bacteria. Acid CIP will remove that additional. It's important to do this one after another, and I would kind of rearrange those. So you do a hot water rinse. You do a pre-caustic cycle, that's optional. Um, then a caustic cycle for uh, 50, 30 minutes through the spray ball, then 15 minutes through your ports at two to 5%, followed immediately by an acid cycle, and then followed immediately by your sanitizer cycle. And you wanna mix your sanitizers here because bacteria can become accustomed to Ida-4, they can be accustomed to uh, parasitic acid. And talk to your chemical supplier because they're gonna know like the best things for you guys to do. So in summary, uh, know your organisms, the optimal temperature, hot tolerance, lactic acid range. Um, if you don't know them, that's okay. But just understand like where you are in your production space, how aggressive, non-aggressive uh, the strains can act in that space. Um, be mindful, like your mill is a big source of contamination and the shit is in the air. I had an argument <laughs> with, at my last brewery because I was trying to explain to uh, one of the owners that, well, you have an open mill and the shit's in the air. And he's like, but I'm not physically touching it. I'm like, how do I explain the shit's in the air, man? It just goes, it's in the air. It's very confusing. So yeah, so that is a source of contamination. It's a big source. Uh, yeah, understand your production constraints. Understand, you know, what you're willing, not willing to accept, uh, particularly in distribution. Is it gonna keep cold? Are you not distributing? Like, um, are you fine? Serpent, for example, when we did Serpent with Thornbridge, you know, we were kind of fine for that beer to evolve in the package. And that's what we wanted. And, you know, you find some out there and it's still evolving. And then clean, clean your brewery. And understand that like this in encyclopedia is evolving. So, Find freedom in the canvas, and then there's my bunny, and then I have a bunch of resources. So, any questions? No questions, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. Yeah, it's the same benefits. What you want to do is you want to add that second batch during that lactic acid producing phase. So ideally within that 24 hour period, because you don't want it to do like produce lactic acid and then start producing ethanol. And once it starts producing ethanol, it's slowly kind of dying, it's slowly killing itself. You kind of want to keep it, it's like a relay race. You want to keep it in that range of like 
you know, chewing glucose, chewing glucose, happy, 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 and then woof. All right. Yeah, so I'm going to say in C here, and I apologize. So 65C, that brewer's window where you're hitting both alpha and beta, that's, you're going to get, for Philly Sour, you're going to get a pH range around 3.5, 3, 4. Anything lower where you're hitting your beta, where you're creating more glucose, I've seen brewers claim, and you know, this is where your pH adjustment, make sure you adjust your pH meter every day or calibrate it every day. Uh, they claim that they've seen it hit as low as 3.1, which is pretty low for Philly Sour. Um, and I think that's pretty low for most La Chancea strains. Um, so that's where like you can modulate, you know, that acid production. If you want to go higher, you'd probably end like in the 3.7 range. Uh, also, to the a corollary to that point, n uh, neither Philly Sour or Sour VCA ferment lactose either. So if you're looking to build body, that's also an option. So um, if you're doing the titration, mm -hmm. the percent of the lactose, you know, Yeah, so, sorry, I don't like go back. Uh, so sour VC is a really good example here because it will produce like 12 grams per liter of lactic um, and you see this that total acidity that percentage you see how that pops up on that that blue line um, that's hitting yeah 1.2 percent that's severe that's a lot of lactic acid I will say though and this is another point with both these strains it the Lactic perception with Philly Sour and Sour VC tastes completely different than they do for a kettle sour beer. It's a lot softer, it's a lot more digestible. Um, so you're not getting that astringent, you know, that acid churning that you sometimes get with kettle sours, you're not getting that with these. Um, if you find Margarita Goza, that's straight Sour VC. Uh, so you're, you are seeing a 1.2 like percent lactic lactic acid in there, which is... Not necessarily, well, you can't measure your citric, you would just have to titrate that out. Yeah, you can, you can do that, you just have to know the mole, um, you just have to, uh, to put that into the calculation. Yeah, so, um, I think ASBC has that as well as an example. It's it's beer method eight on the ASBC beer method. Uh, if you're looking for that, it's it's method eight. Yeah, but it would be I, it would be the same calculation. You just have to know the citric mole. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you, Molly. Thank you guys yes. for coming. Enjoy the rest of your conference.